Welcome everybody. I think uh, people are still just coming in, um, but we'll get started on our, our final session, our final formal session of the day. It's been a uh, extremely um, stimulating day and exhausting day. Um, I think uh, there's been a huge amount going on and a huge number of ideas and points have been raised. So um, it's, it's been a, a fantastic first day. I'm James Robson. I'm a lecturer in higher education at Oxford University. Uh, I'm part of CGHE, I sit on the Research Management Committee and I'm a CI on the Research on Research project. I'm delighted to chair this session on the issue of whether there are too many graduates. To me, this provocative title gets right to the heart of many of the policy tensions that currently exist in higher education. And so I'm thoroughly looking forward to a very interesting debate. The session will last 50 minutes and will comprise three presentations from Paul Ashwin, Golo Henseki and Claire Callender in that order, followed by a q and I'm sure you all know the format by now. Put your comments and questions in the chat and I will then uh, put together a call list of questions. Uh, timing will be tight, so start adding your comments early to make sure that you get a chance of asking your question. But at the end of the session, we'll move into a breakout room to continue the conversation. That will be going on at the same time as a series of a lounge sessions where people, particularly DPhil students, have put together topics to discuss starting at six. So if you're not coming to the breakout session from, from this conversation, I do encourage you to go to those lounge sessions. And I think you can access them through the conference website by clicking on the lounge section of the site. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. So starting with, uh, with Paul Ashwin. Paul is Professor of Higher Education and Head of Department in the Department of Educational Research at Lancaster University. His research interests are particularly focused on the relations between teaching, learning and knowledge curriculum practices in higher education. He is coordinating editor of higher education and co-editor of the new Bloomsbury book series, Understanding Student Experiences of Higher Education. Paul is Deputy Director of CGHE and leads the Centre's project focused on understanding knowledge curriculum and student agency. Next we'll have Golo Henseki. Golo is a senior researcher at UCL IOE. His research cuts across multiple themes in labour economics. It illuminates patterns and determinants of heterogeneity in graduate outcomes in the labour market and beyond, examines the role of school quality on job outcomes over the life cycle and analyzes the relation of job quality with workers' health and well-being. Golo leads the CGHE project focused on heterogeneity of the graduate labor market in the UK and Europe. And finally, we'll have Claire Callender. Claire is Professor of Higher Education Studies at UCL Institute of Education and at Birkbeck University of London. Her research writing and policy advice focuses or focus on student finances in higher education and related issues. Claire was awarded an OBE in the New Year's Honours List in 2017 for services to higher education. And she is Deputy Director of CGHE, responsible for projects on the labour market and equity and student loan debt and graduate decision making. So I'll hand over to our first speaker, Paul. Paul, take it away. Uh, Paul, you're muted. Funny, it's been so long wondering about whether people can see your slides and then they can't hear you. So apologies for that. Right, now you can hear me when I'm asking you whether you can see my slides, so we'll start again. Um, so um, it's, it's great to be part of this panel on two whether there's too many graduates and whether that perpetuates or challenges inequalities. Um, from my perspective, the question of too many graduates raises questions about how we assess value of graduates. And we've already heard plenty of times today about the notion of low value courses and, and what that means and what the graduates mean. And often when we think about whether there's too many graduates, people talk in terms of graduate salaries and the difference between what graduates earn compared to non-graduates. We've already discussed that a lot today. And also it's often discussed in terms of generic graduate attributes and whether um, students and graduates have developed those through their um, engagement in higher education. 
Um, my position on this is that neither of these ways of thinking actually reflect the educational value of an undergraduate degree. Neither of these things are actually what undergraduate degrees are designed to do. Their language that higher education is very happy to accept in their favour, but my view is it actually leads higher education into some quite unhelpful avenues because it's not what a degree is designed to do. So to kind of think about some data about how we might um, think about this question in a different way that focuses on the educational purposes of an undergraduate degree, I'm going to draw on a limited amount of data from two CG projects. So the first project that James mentioned was in the first phase of CG, where we track students through the three or four years of their chemical or chemical engineering or chemistry degrees in England, South Africa and the US. And we had around 10 case study students per department and we tracked them through the three or four years of their degrees to think about how they're approaching their studies. That project is now finished and we're into a new project, um, the Graduate Experiences of Employability and Knowledge Project, the GEEK project, um, where what we're doing is continuing to follow the same students who are now mainly graduates, most of them, through the next three years and looking at how they draw on knowledge and experiences they've gained at university in their later lives. Now, I need to point out this is a um, international research team um, at Lancaster. There's me and Jan MacArthur, Kaylee Rosewell and Dee Dalglish. In South Africa, we have Rene Smith, Mags Blackie and Ashish Garal. And in the US, Jenny Case, Nicole Peterson, Allah Abdullah and Benjamin Goldschneider. And we're all working together to think about how we look at these issues. And this kind of focuses on how does higher education transform students if it does indeed transform them. So the notion that students come in and a university degree gives them access to knowledge that changes their sense of what the world is, changes their sense of who they are, changes their sense of what they can do in the world. And we're looking at this across a number of dimensions across both the projects I mentioned. So how do students and graduates see their contribution to society changing? How do they see their sense of agency changing or not changing over the course of their degrees? How does the curriculum and different kinds of curriculum structures relate to changes or non-changes in students' experiences? And then the two things I'll really focus on today, how do students' sense of the knowledge they're studying change over the course of their degree and once they graduate? And how do their personal projects change or not change um, during their degree and as they graduate? And by personal projects, we're kind of talking about what are students trying to achieve with their education? What do they see it as for? What does it enable them to do in the world? So the kind of trajectories we're getting, looking when we look across the number of, um, you know, the four years now, five years of interviews we've got with students, we can kind of track their sense of what their projects are. So for some students across all of those interviews, there's no real, really clear sense of where they think they're going with their degree, what it's allowing them to do. For other students, there's a sense that they come with a project and all of their experiences at university confirm them on where they want to go after they leave university. Other students arrive not really certain where they're going, but through studying or through their university experiences, they find a project that they're really, you know, a personal project that they're really excited by. Others come with quite a broad project that over the time of their degree narrows down, whereas for other students it opens up. They come with something very specific and then the experiences of studying actually make them think about wider options. And then for some students, their personal project that they come with at university gets completely derailed. They thought they were gonna do one thing and then their experience at university means that, that they stop doing that and move to a new direction. Now, not all of these projects are related to the knowledge that students engage with. For some students, their project is kind of completely unrelated to the degree that they're studying. For other students, there's a sense of, they, you know, they need a degree certificate to do what they're doing, but in fact, the content of their degree, the knowledge they're engaging with, isn't at all important for what they're doing. For further students, there's a sense that the knowledge becomes absolutely central to everything they're trying to achieve, and then for other students, it's actually the knowledge that generates what they want to do. They couldn't have even done it without the knowledge they engage with 
um, in relation to their undergraduate degree. So you can kind of see in these different roles um, that, that knowledge plays, that that raises a question for the students where the knowledge plays no role, does that mean that actually going to university wasn't worth it? And I've got two, two quotes from different graduates um, from interviews we did this year that kind of highlight this difference. So the first one saying, reflecting back on the knowledge from their, their chemical engineering degree, I want to stand, understand how everything works rather than just accepting that it does work. That's it really. Yes, I want to understand the way things work more. I don't like not knowing how something works because without that, you're just playing a game really. And the other graduate says, I can't remember anything at all from my degree. I would say a lot of things that I think might apply to chemical engineering, like reading the back of a chocolate bar or something. I don't really feel anything. The things that I need to know now are different from the things that I needed to know in the past. So it's good to have my, so it's good that my mind is getting rid of irrelevant things and then is focusing on what I need to know now. So the reason for drawing that contrast, and clearly I've selected those carefully to make, make the point I want to make, is that we might say in relation to that, in relation to that second quote, even though we accept it's a particular quote at a particular time, if that's how students feel, then maybe that's a graduate too many. They're not doing anything with the knowledge. Is that, you know, it, what, was that someone who might have benefited in a different way from a degree? My response would be, well, maybe, but previous education achievement, the social privilege of students don't tell you which students are going to feel like that. Across the um, range of students we have, we have students coming from very academic backgrounds, students who come via foundation courses, and you can't map that previous trajectory to how useful they feel their knowledge is after they graduate. So if we kind of close things down in terms of saying, well, you need to have minimum entry requirements, actually those students who come and have their lives transformed by knowledge will miss out will end up reinforcing inequalities rather than challenging them. Another response, and this is where I'll finish, don't worry, James, um, uh, which is that we, we might say, no, it doesn't mean there are too many graduates, but it does mean that we need to take our educational responsibilities seriously. If we're going to say that what higher education does is give students transformational access to knowledge, then we need to design our courses that puts that transformation at its center. So as I said at the opening session today, we need to think about who our students are and how our degree programs are designed to give them access to knowledge. Not bemoan that they're the wrong students, not say, oh, if only students were how they used to be, it will be all right. But actually say, who are our students now? And how do we design something that gives them access to important and powerful knowledge that changes a student and changes their relationship to the world? And take responsibility for thinking about who students are going to become through engaging with this knowledge, what they're going to do in society. And we don't often think about that as universities. We say, well, that's up to the student. But my position would be, my argument would be, and I think it's supported by the data from, the, from my project, is that if we're going to invite students in, we need to have a sense of where this knowledge is going to take them. And that sense of that second graduate, the, the second graduate who didn't kind of feel that the knowledge was now relevant. They were getting rid of that irrelevant stuff that they studied their degree. You know, one of the tendencies that we need to be careful of is we can say, oh, well, that's happening now because of more students coming to universities. Those narratives have always been around. As long as there's been literature on students, students have been getting worse. So we have to not fall into that pessimism. We have to be optimistic about what students can achieve if we give them access to powerful knowledge. But we also have to take our responsibilities seriously in thinking about powerful ways of giving them access to that knowledge. Thanks, Paul. Uh, an excellent way to link back to our initial session as well um, and, and start to unpack those ideas and problematizing knowledge in the HE space. Uh, let's move swiftly on to, on to Golo. Um, and I'll just remind everyone to keep putting your questions in the chat so we can have a good conversation afterwards. Um, okay, I think you should be able to hear me and, and see my slides. Am I? Okay, very good. 
All right. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, it's a great pleasure that I can present findings from our CG research project of what makes a graduate job and how it might have changed with time. And so during, I will look at the demand side of the labor market during the expansion of mass higher education, really. In this, so in this talk, I look at the demand, yeah, as I said, the demand side of labor markets and shed light on development that might help us to understand why um, there's been actually a decoupling of education expansing, expansion and gains in living standards. Um, and this is shared work with Alan Falstad, um, Duncan Galley, and Francis Green. So when we talk about too many graduates, where, where does that actually come from? In Britain, the labor force educated to degree level rose by a factor of 2.8 from 3.4 million in 1997 to, to, to 9.5 million in 2019. Not all of that is um, growth of British graduates. It's also international migration, but a lot of it is um, coming through expansion of the system. Um, in this fact, and this is equal to averages to an annual growth rate of 4.7%. So that's huge. And it means a doubling of the number of graduates in the labor force every 15 years at that pace. And given how the economy and everything else changes, it's a great deal. Um, I think the average annual growth of the economy of economic output over the same period was close to 2%. So it's a very, it's, it's, it's greatly different. So within this context, do we then have too many graduates just about right number of graduates or are they hardly enough? Usually economists answer this kind of question by looking at the wages and we have heard already Paul mentioning wages and how we have heard a lot about this. And um, yes, we have heard a lot about it and usually you see graduates do better than non-graduates. And we can look at as well the prevalence of graduates who are not in graduate jobs is another thing economists like to do. But while Insightful does not tell the full stories, and I want to take a different approach here in this talk. Through one of the tro, one of the most famous scholars of mass higher education system has been quoted that graduates in mass system will start to seek employment without loss of dignity wherever the jobs may exist. So how does that look in practice? Um, in Britain, this transformation is visible in graduate destinations. This chart plots graduate attainment in the total workforce, that's the little blue bars, within higher professional and managerial jobs, that's the dark green bars, um, law professional and managerial, um, this kind of mint green bars, and then we have the light green bars, which is the percentage of graduates in intermediate, semi-routine and routine occupations. So what stands out? So first of all, the percentage of university graduates in the labor force almost doubled, or more than doubled actually, from 14% to 32% in 2019. The share of graduates within higher professional managerial jobs rose from 46 in 1997 to 58 in 2019. And um, we have some, and the share, the share rose as well among lower professional managerial jobs and outside um, professional managerial jobs. Um, but what you might not notice or what you might not see at the first sight is that this growth of the percentage of graduates in higher professional managerial jobs actually came to a standstill after 2007. We've got 55% here in 2007 and about 57% in 2019. What has happened? We have seen a growth, uh, particularly in lower managerial professional professional jobs. Alongside this mass expansion of higher education, there has been a rise in degree requirements to get a job, uh, i.e., um, a greater number of jobs these days require a degree on entry. In, and this followed very similar trajectories, actually. In Britain, the share of jobs which require a degree almost doubled uh, from 15% in 1997 to 29% in 2017. Um, and this was particularly fast around the time of the recession from 2006 to 2012. 
this trend is actually very similar to what we've seen, what we see elsewhere. There's been um, research done for the US showing some very similar trends that after the Great Recession around the same time, um, the percentage of jobs requiring degree level qualifications at entry has risen. There's less known about this trend outside of the, of the states and um, in general, in, 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 yeah, in general, what has been behind this. Economists sort of take an optimistic view often. They um, would argue that this up that this um, rising demand for higher education qualifications in the labor market is a sign of upskilling, that we have all these new, nice new technologies that improve the productivity of um, skilled workers and specifically graduates. And as a result, the demand for higher for graduate skills increases and that is expressed in the rise in, degree, in demand for degree qualifications. On the other hand, we have more pessimistic accounts of what might have happened, um, that there might have been a, a maturation of these kind of technologies that push um, the demand for graduate skills um, in the beginning of the 20th 21st century. Um, and as a result, technology has become less skill biased. Now we need less graduates to actually do um, maintain that um, level of technology that we currently have. Plus, we have the global expansion of higher education, which puts um, strain on um, labor markets. Um, graduates, if they seek employment without loss of dignity, wherever the jobs are, means they cascade down the um, occupational hierarchy. In this pessimistic view, this expansion of demand for degree qualifications to access jobs is not equal, it does not equal an increase in the graduate skills demand. So what we try to do in this paper is we try to better understand what is actually behind, what is, has been, what's been behind this increasing demand for graduate um, requirements at job entry. Specifically, we look at a component that is task warranted, i.e. do we see a change in the job task mix um, towards job tasks that usually are done by graduates, or is this task, is this change task un unwarranted? Um, the first component could be kind of interpreted as upskilling, the second one has been termed by others as upcredentialing. It's not necessarily a great word, a uh, great term for this, but it sort of um, means we see a change in the degree requirements for jobs that have been done, for the similar jobs that have been done previously by non-graduates. We have got different data, we draw on, um, for this research project, we draw on the Skills and Employment Survey. Um, this is a repeated cross-sectional survey of the UK workforce and been carried out um, from over, over a long period now. Um, about every five years last survey was fielded in 2017. And the great thing about it is it asks workers what they think um, job requirements are, uh, what kind of task are you carrying out and what kind of qualification is needed to do to get the job. Before I turn to this, um, to the results, it is interesting to assess how much of the rise in overall degree requirements is due to changes within occupation. Like, Within occupation change is the transformation of existing occupations, i.e. they become more graduate. Um, and the share of jobs that needed a degree to get almost doubled, um, and I already said that, um, that this 15% increase in the, sh in, in the share of jobs that require a degree on entry is mostly down to um, an increase in degree requirements within occupations. So in other words, a substantial chunk of this increase is due to job starting to require a degree. That's like this first within occupation bar. How does that then match the change in tasks on a job? Has the job task make changed alongside this? And this table um, lists the trend on some of the more like call them academic tasks. And compared with the end of the, with the, end of the 1990s, there has been an increase. Um, you can see this Delta column is all positive. So all this task has, the task intensity, the importance of these tasks have grown on the labor force overall. It particularly stands out as of course, the use of IT on the workplace. And that's, that's been a massive change alongside the mass 
expansion of higher education. And again, like the degree requires, mostly it's down to within occupation change. So it's upskilling within um, occupations. So let's have a look at our results. Between, so in our first decade, between 1997 and 2006, this change in job task mix actually accounts for the whole in ch change in job in degree requirements in the labor force. In, in the second part of our observation window, however, this hasn't been, this hasn't been the case. Um, there has been an increase in degree requirements in the labor market that hasn't been backed up by changes in the job task mix. And this would be consistent with a slowdown in the demand for graduate skills, a rising and potential rising signal power, signaling power of degree qualification of something underlying, um, some underlying attribute that employers value. And what could that be? Um, there's been a recent article, like a small news piece in Times Higher, which reported from shifted towards wanting work ready graduates. Um, apparently, 28% of respondents in this Times Higher survey um, believe the purpose of universities was to produce ready to work graduates, um, up from just 8% a decade ago. If that's the case, um, we would expect that graduates do have an advantage in um, requiring less time to learn um, to do the job. And that's half what we looked at as well to try to understand better, is that the case? And we find um, indeed that graduates do have an advantage when it comes to learning and training times. They do require less time to get ready for a job and less training to get ready for a job. And if we are in a period with low productivity growth, where really the only thing an employer can can do to um, get an advantage is to get people in that are job ready, um, saving, shaving off some training costs, um, that would be consistent with the picture that we found. We therefore think that the expansion of degree require, requirements for otherwise unchanged jobs might be partly in pursuit of these job ready candidates. And that, if so, is consistent with the long-term decline in workplace training. Just to sum up, um, to answer this question, to, is there, are there too many graduates? It's not really down to higher education. It's within the wider system in which we operate um, if we have too many graduates or too few graduates. And the situation can change again, and we and we'll see. Uh, we just see. OK, um, this is it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Golo, an excellent presentation. and. Uh... You know, thank you for sharing your, your data and an important conclusion, I think, that uh, you know, the, the labour market determines uh, these structures and, uh, and the numbers and the way that individuals experience. So let's hand over quickly to, uh, to Claire. Um, Claire, would you mind stopping sharing your screen and we can move to Claire. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you so much. Can you see the screen OK? The slides? Not yet, no. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, let's try again, sorry. There we go. Okay. Yes, that's great. Oh, Apologies. Okay, um, well, I'm delighted to contribute to this session and it's going to, uh, our focus is rather different um, because our research has been looking into the effects of student loan debt on graduates' financial and uh, life decisions. And although I'm presenting today, uh, there are other people who have contributed, particularly um, Ariane de Gaudon, who's in the audience today and is now at Trent University, and Stephen Desjardins from the University of Michigan. And the other person who needs introducing in the, in the audience is Clarice Cooper, who has recently joined us but hasn't worked on the things that I'm going to be talking about. So the increasing uh, use of student loans to fund higher education is a global phenomenon and has helped HE expansion. And England is absolutely no, no exception to that. 
In fact, um, we in England are more reliant on student loans to fund our growing higher education system than any other country in any other OECD country. Today, 94% of all undergraduates in England take out a government backed loan to pay for their tuition fees and towards their living costs. So we can anticipate that these graduates are going to end their university days or their undergraduate days with debts of approximately £50,000 or $70,000. But we know very little about the consequences of that debt accumulation on graduates' lives. Work has been done in the US, but it may not, for a variety of reasons, uh, be relevant to students um, with debt in England. And so what we've been doing is we're looking at what role student loan debt plays on graduates' lives, on their post-graduation aspirations and choices, including issues around their labor market behavior, their financial and psychological well-being, housing options, marriage and family formations. And we're also interested in how graduates' behavior and choices may vary depending on their characteristics and also in comparison to non-graduates. And of course, we're interested in the implications for policy. So how have we gone about doing our work? We've taken a mixed methods approach. The research I'm going to talk to you about and the work we've done to date has focused on analyzing data from a long, an existing longitudinal uh, data set of English pupils born between 1989 and 1990, who've been interviewed regularly since the age of, of 12 and, uh, sorry, 13 and 14. And the most recent data um, uh, covers over 7,000 individuals at the age of 25. And they include graduates and non-graduates. Over and above that, um, we have just completed over 100 interviews, in-depth interviews um, with graduates, which will start analyzing, but haven't done so, so far. So what some of the findings or the most interesting findings, is especially in relation to inequalities uh, and, and the overall topic of this session. Well, to date, the most dramatic finding and potentially the most far reaching in terms of um, student loan debt, perpetuating inequalities is in relation to housing. And I want to focus on that for the rest of the five minutes or however much James I've got left. So how might student loan debt impact or affect young people's housing options? First of all, it's very important to note that, um, that the student loan repayments are taken out automatically out of graduates pay packet. And we want to know the extent to which student loans may be exacerbating existing housing problems experienced by young people. Because one thing that we know is that um, young people today are far less likely to be owner occupiers and they're far more likely to live with their parents than generations ago. And indeed, some would argue that there's now a youth housing crisis because of rising property prices, because of the decline in affordable housing, because of falling home ownership and rising levels of long-term renting. But these issues, the, the housing problems being experienced by young people are not exclusively associated with the housing market. They're not exclusively determined by the supply and demand of housing and about the financialization of the housing market. What, our, what research shows is that the problems that young people face in terms of their housing are also structured by insecure labor market conditions and stagnating wa uh, wages, some of the issues that, that Golo actually was talking about. They're structured by access to mortgages and the nature of welfare system. So in England, access to social security benefits and housing benefits. But what I hope to be able to show is that actually housing that higher education funding policies and student loan debt in particular also play a very important role 
in structuring young people's housing options. And on this screen, on the screen on this slide, we can see some of the ways in which in which loan repayments potentially can limit um, and affect students, um, uh, graduates' housing options. Because the repayments are automatically taken out of the graduates' pay packet, they end up with a lower take-home pay. That means they have less disposable income, they may be less able to save, which takes them longer to raise a deposit for a mortgage, and they may have less money to spend on a monthly mortgage. Similarly, loan repayments, which continue well into a graduate's working life, will affect how much a mortgage lender is willing to lend a graduate, which in turn affects the amount of, 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 um, of, of loan that a, a graduate can get from, a, from a, a mortgage lender and also the sort of properties that they can buy. Graduate borrowers also will have low, lower take-home pay, which might affect what they can afford to rent. And it might encourage them to live with their parents because living with mum and dad is by far the most affordable housing option. And for some graduates who are indebted, living with mum and dad may give them an opportunity to actually save towards a, uh, a, a mortgage. So what did we actually find? Well, we use this longer, longitudinal data set of over 7,000 individuals at the age of 25. And we divided them into three different groups. Firstly, we divided them into those who were non-graduates, those who had never been to university. Then there were graduates who'd been to university and had borrowed, i.e. they'd taken out a student loan. And then there was another group, graduate non-borrowers, who attended higher education, but didn't need to borrow. So after controlling for differences in individuals' demographics and their socioeconomic backgrounds and the region's housing market, we find that graduate non-borrowers, those who didn't take out a student loan, who went to university, are 16 percentage po points more likely to be a homeowner than people who never went to university. Maybe that's something we'd expect given the purported advantages of higher education. But graduate non-borrowers are also 13.1 percentage points more likely to be homeowners than graduates who borrowed and took out a student loan. And significantly, the likelihood of graduate borrowers owning their own home is the same as non-graduates, those who never went to university. So what these findings suggest is that graduates who've taken out a loan seem unable to capitalize on their higher education in terms of home ownership. Student loans appear to be contributing to a lack of home ownership amongst those students who borrowed to go to university. And this really matters. Home ownership is the most significant source of individual wealth. So it matters because England's higher education funding system and loans in particular may be perpetuating inequalities in wealth. Now the flip side to these findings is that um, and adding to the advantageous housing situation of graduates without loans is that graduate non-borrowers are less likely to live in rented accommodation or to live with their parents. So graduate non-borrowers are 6.4 percentage points less likely to rent than those who never went to university and 7.4 percentage points less likely than graduates who borrowed. In addition, graduate non-borrowers are 9.3 percentage points less likely to live with their parents once they've graduated compared to graduates who borrow. So again, this matters because it's the poorest graduates who are most likely to live with their parents after university. And in a non-COVID, non-remote working environment, being confi confined to a particular place or town largely confines these graduates to their local labour market, potentially limiting 
their labour market opportunities and choices. So to conclude, our findings clearly show that the burden of student loan debt at age 25 is particularly visible through the advantageous housing choices that graduates who don't borrow have compared to those who took out loans to fund their undergraduate studies and those who never attended higher education. And this is despite the fact that student loans in England are income contingent and have inbuilt financial protections against unaffordable loan repayments. The findings suggest that higher education funding policies in England are very important for understanding young people's housing tenure and that, that the funding policies may perpetuate inequalities in the wealth and opportunity between graduates and between graduates and non-graduates. But, and it is a very important but, student loans can also challenge inequalities. Student loans are a vital instrument of equity by allowing access to higher education amongst those who might otherwise be unable to attend. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, a fantastic um, presentation and uh, such a, a rich and stimulating topic. And it's great to see that the questions are, are coming in. Um, I've said in the chat that we'll, we'll take them uh, in the for following order of uh, Lauren, Gerald, Colin and Zach, and then pick up Hopefully we'll be able to cover all of those and then we'll, we'll pick up as more come in. So let me bring in, uh, I think, Lauren and then Gerald together uh, and then we'll get some responses. So Lauren, would you like to, um, to ask your question? I know Paul's already had a stab at answering it, but we can explore it a little bit more, I think. Yeah, sure. So my question was about um, the number of graduates who take up employment in horizontally mismatched jobs. So when they go into a field that's not related to what they, they studied in their undergraduate, um, and how that really plays into, I was originally asking um, Paul's argument about, you know, the, um, how we're questioning um, the important knowledge that should be in consideration when we're deciding curricula. Um, but I'd also love to hear like Golo or like your thoughts on how um, horizontal mismatch really plays into this whole conversation. Thanks, Lauren. And can we bring in uh, Gerald as well, quickly? James, thank you. Um, so my first question was, uh, is this covering only in the UK or is it actually covering outside the UK? Uh, but if it's covering only in the UK, then my, my second question about the, the whole point of having a student loan, which is be because uh, the, the fees that individual students have to pay domestic students uh, may result in the case that we are observing in the US where they have a ballooning 1.6 trillion uh, problem that's going to blow up. So uh, depending, is it going to be just covering the UK or, or outside? Thank you. Thanks, Gerald. I think it probably covers much more than the UK, but let's uh, hand over to, um, to Paul first um, and then uh, see if Gola would like to respond to any of these and then, then Claire and perhaps any of the other people. No, I was more interested to hear what Gola had to say than, <laughs> than saying what I'd already said. Um, but I mean, I mean my, my, kind, my kind of, Re response to Lauren was was really that 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 I kind of worry that that, that sometimes in these discussions and, and certainly it's what governments do it's happened in Australia in terms of these be, you know certain courses being seen as important and you know normally it's not liberal arts but you know Lauren's given us a different position where it is liberal arts being foreground sometimes it's particular design of curricula that get get foregrounded whether that's problem based learning or whether it's flipped classroom or whatever. And, and for me, where I end up with this analysis, analysis is a sense that really it's for academics in partnerships with other people in universities and employers to really think through, well, what is this knowledge and how do we give as wide a range of people access to it as we can? And then what does our design look like? And it needs to be a bespoke design that changes according to the knowledge we want students to engage with and also with the students that we're wishing to engage. And so, that, and so that must always change. In relation to Gerald's question about whether it's just the UK, um, our project's looking at students in, in England, the US and South Africa. And 
you know that, that there are some clear differences between between those contexts and the way students come in and and even the structure of degree programs so you know the the first year the, the second year in the US and South Africa is more like the first year in, in English undergraduate courses. But actually, when you look at the trajectories through knowledge that students have, they're remarkably similar. And partly we've designed that in. That was part of the reason for choosing chemical, chemical engineering and chemistry was because there's some kind of sense of an international um, curricula there that you wouldn't have like in a previous project we looked at sociology and sociology projects you know really changed a uh, project sociology curricula changed dramatically according to the national context that you're in thanks paul Gola, would you like to um to add to that yeah it's just briefly to add to um paul's account um I, I mean i have mostly looked at vertical mismatch rather than horizontal mismatch if i look at um kind of what task employers want um like in job vacancy data it's 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 surprisingly a great deal um generic generic stuff it's very little specific it's often to um, teamwork communication writing written and so forth so you might think a liberal arts is the answer to it it is sort of it's this paradox that on uh, that that sort of is often um at least in the economic literature thought of um higher education endows students with this ability to fit in and solve problems and can do what, whatever problem is thrown at them. On the other hand, it's the more um, professional, like the more um, vocational subjects that receive the highest earning. And I guess that's where this um, concept of horizontal mismatch is more coming from. So I, I'm, I'm also left a little bit with a, with a, with a puzzle that I can't fully um, explain right at the moment, but I think there is a lot great deal as well with the um, career trajectories and which which of these careers actually lead them into sort of leadership positions, um, where you then get and, and that doesn't get then fully accounted for. What um, how how well do this um, degree set you up for a career outside of your profession? Thanks, Golo. I, I think we've got time to um, to to bring in um, Colin and Zach. Um, who have both got um, quite similar questions. So, um, Colin, do you want to come in? Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I was just thinking out loud, really, in response to what um, Claire was uh, talking about with the um, the problem with the housing market and getting a mortgage. I just wondered whether it'd be that much different if you had to say, well, I'm paying out this additional £50 a, a month uh, in because I'm a graduate, and that's the tax, um, you know, because it's income contingent, you might be paying more in tax a month. And that might be very, very similar to what you'd be paying in your student loan. So I wonder if the it's the problem that you have to declare to the lender of a mortgage that you've got this this debt as a, a, a as a, or, or do, 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 as far as I remember, last time I applied for mortgage, they, they were more concerned about what my uh, income was, what my outgoings were, which would include um, a higher rate of tax uh, than they were about what. What the reasons for the outgoing were so I, and i know it's difficult it, it's difficult to compare but that's the only other real way of affording uh, uh you know self-funded higher education and so i just wonder where it was the lump sum is is the real blockage thanks colin um very briefly can i just bring in zach to ask uh his, his question quickly Thanks, James. Thanks, colleagues. Um, my question was mainly directed at Professor Callender's discussion on uh, housing uh, participation post-graduation in relation to indebtedness. And um, if anybody in your research team has picked up on the, uh, the effects of indebtedness on students' decision-making about what typology of housing they wish to participate in um, and whether or not they perceive things like co-living, tiny houses, et cetera, as trying to be uh, sort of minimizing their, their short and medium long-term uh, debt in relation to housing, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll start if I may and then Ariane come in if there are any issues that, you know I'm not covering well enough. Um, so the important thing is that student loans don't affect um, students cr uh, graduates credit rating in any shape or form. Okay, so that's one important thing to 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 to, to appreciate. Um, 
what what it just means is that they're looking at their their outgoings and um, the the vast majority of students are going to be repaying their loans for the next 30 years okay i mean only 83 percent of all students will have um you know what will, will the 83 percent of students will continue paying until their debt is written off um after 30 years so they've got this ongoing commitment so it's that ongoing commitment um, that is taken into consideration um, and that of their, because it affects um, their overall income. Whether um, it would make a, a difference if it was a graduate tax, it probably would have the same, same effect. Back to your, um, back to Zach's comment. Um, okay, so we have, um, th this particular piece of work, we, were only using a quantitative a existing longitudinal set. So um, we're just analyzing that data, which doesn't give us any insights, <coughs> excuse me, into why students are choosing one thing rather than the other, um, or gives us very limited insights. Let's put it that way. We are doing qualitative research. We have these hundred interviews that we've just completed, which Keris and Ariane are going to be analyzing. Oh, they're all analyzing together, sorry, the three of us. Um, and it might well be that we will look at some of the issues around housing. I don't know whether we will. It's an incredibly rich data set. And I think it will take us down some other policy roads to look at. So, um, uh, I, I don't know how much we're going to look at, at, at more at, at, at issues to do with housing. That doesn't mean I don't think it's important. Um, it's just that um, there are other interesting themes to pursue and that are very, very exciting that haven't been discussed or talked about before, just as nobody's looked in this country at the relationship between housing and student loan debt. So in that sense, this is a very exciting paper. We published it in the Journal of Social Policy because intentionally rather than a higher ed, because actually we want the housing people of this world to start to look at it. Well, we may well write something else specifically for a housing population uh, audience. Does that, does that address the questions? <laughs> it's, it's, it's excellent. I'm, I'm very conscious of time. Um, and that uh, people need to uh, need to move on. Um, I do hope that um, you'll all be able to join us in the breakout room, which we can move to now to continue this discussion. And several people have raised some excellent questions uh, in the chat that I hope we can discuss more. At the same time, as uh, as Carly's pointed out, there's uh, there's lounge sessions which have just started. Um, so if you're not coming to uh, to the breakout session, do go to those. Um, but if you're not, not joining us for those, thank you very much for participating in today's session and for an excellent day. Uh, it's been incredibly stimulating and uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. Thanks very much and see you in the breakout session. See you there, thank you.